All right, folks, in today's episode of Whitetail Cribs, we are revisiting the top non-typical bucks that we filmed in previous episodes from 2021. It's been a good run. This is going to be the last episode of Whitetail Cribs that you're going to see until quarter three of 2022. So thanks for all the support. Let's get into today's episode. So this deer here has triple beam, triple brows, double brows, drop tine, flyer. This side right here alone is 102 inches. Um, you can't get your hands around his base. It's just a huge deer. The crazy thing about this, this deer was also six and a half. We knew him at four, we knew him at five. And actually at five, he was a huge eight. And I had him early muzzleloader hunting and the deer came out and was standing at 50 yards for like 20 minutes. And I could have killed him a hundred times over and he could not see him through the leaves. And the deer walked away and we, I mean, again, again, I, I can't, I can't, I can't say enough about him making the right decision. If you don't have a clear shot, don't force a shot. So he didn't and look what happened. But the next year at six and a half, this is what he turned into, um, just got gnarly. And we, once he did get him down on his left back hip, um, there was a broadhead hole in the hide. Somebody had shot him the year before, presumably because he was a perfect eight all the other years. So October 25th of this year, I have an encounter with him. He comes in, there's a four year old, walks right below me in the morning and he's 30, 40 yards behind him. But as, as big old deer do, he just knew something wasn't right. And the four year old walked right under me 10 yards. And this one stopped up about 50, 55 yards out. Wasn't comfortable. I think he got just a little whiff of something, but he turned around and walked away and they, he was leaving his bedding area crossing a dam of a, a pond that sets in the middle of the timber. So anyway, two days later, I go in and I hunt on the other side of the dam of the pond, but in the evening, and those two came across the dam of the pond, came by me at 10 yards and then ducked down the hill and was going down the bottom. He was a fair distance behind me because he stopped at the pond and got a drink. Well, when he came across, rather because they went down the hill, rather than him following, as they always do, he cut the corner on me and, and, and cut the corner off the dam of the pond. Well, I went into panic mode, I'm not gonna lie. Yanked the bow back and I did not know the distance because I mean, he started running down to meet up with the other deer and I stopped him and he's, he's face downhill and, and I'm kind of on two sides of a hill and I think I canted my bow if we're being honest between a rush shot and canted a bow, I, I did not make a great shot, but the moral of the story is, is that I hit him high and forward and I went through both shoulder blades. And then we looked and looked for two days, three days and did not find him. And I don't know if that's the reason that we run Baltimore off the farm looking for him. I even was sitting out there at night waiting so I could hear coyotes to go in on him. I mean, I did everything I could to recover this deer. He was gone for over a month and then in late November, popped up with trail cameras again. Started showing back up, seemingly no worse for the wear. And then January 5th, we I had him late muzzleloader tag and he's with six other bucks. I think there were seven total. And I was telling him to get, get set up, get ready, this is late muzzleloader. And when he was getting in to shoot where the first buck was crossing the creek, uh, it seen him, they all ran up the hill, was gone. So we backed out. I gave it a day to rest because they was pretty consistent in there. The wind was different two days later, but we went in and he was the first thing down the hill and Hunter shot and dropped him in his tracks. And that, that, that deer actually is 200 inches. And I, I, it's the only deer I've ever seen that's like that big that doesn't look it like it does. There's no good angle to this deer crazy, crazy story behind that deer. And this is my favorite buck. Not just because of how big he was, but how long I hunted him and just everything that it took to really, you know, kill him. And the fact my nephew Reed uh, was with me 
actually film the hunt. And um, as you can see, I knew I'd have to kill him early that year. Every year he would lose almost this entire side of his, uh, of his antlers. But <clears throat> first in 2016 is kind of when I first started noticing him. Had him in at 20, 25 yards for probably a good 20, 25 minutes. I knew he could be something special if he lived. In that area, there's a decent amount of pressure, so you know I didn't know if he could. And then, so saw him the next year and saw him the year after that. And every time that he came by me, he was always missing pretty much his entire left side. And so uh, 2019, got the trail cameras out and started getting pictures of him. And I was talking to my buddy, Justin Hollinsworth from Ohio. And we you know, started talking about how big he was. And it's like, okay, he's in those 170s. And then he got in those 180s. And then he got, was clearing, clearly in his <clears throat> 190s. And Justin was like, man, I think that sucker is gonna go over 200. And I was like, Man, I don't know. I think he's 190s for sure, but I didn't want to get my hopes up. So when Larry Kirshner uh, scored him for me, it was 201 and 28. <clears throat> the backstory on him is a big cold front came through and, I, and that was the opportunity that I was waiting for. I was waiting for that big temperature change. And my nephew and I were at a football game and we <clears throat> decided to leave and so we could go deer hunting. And I knew where he was, was hanging out for the most part. And so Reed and I got in the tree stand probably around five o'clock. The deer started moving around 6.30, 6.45 that night. And there was a bunch of does coming by. And then the, the deer that you saw on the end, he comes by and Reed pokes me and says, hey, your buck is coming. Cause he knew what we were after. And I didn't see him right away and then saw him. And of course I started getting pretty nervous and he literally came like 11 yards away. I did, you know, what I always do, put the pin on him, release, knew I had a good hit and watched him run off, got some pictures, the one that you saw upstairs and then got video of him and watched him fall over. And Reed was super excited that we had killed him. And I should have known better, but we got out within you know five ten minutes and i'm pretty sure he heard us uh, getting out of the tree stand and so when we got to the spot where he had fallen over he wasn't there and so i started freaking out and i had a another guy that i knew that had a had a tracking dog and so i called him and we probably he probably didn't get out there till midnight one o'clock and we were following the blood trail but it was pretty pretty sparse. I'd hit him back um, just a little bit too far. Still got double lung, but it just barely clipped him and got in the liver. And about 100 yards, we had only made it maybe 50 yards down the trail, but heard from probably about 100 yards away, the guy was yelling and saying they would found it. And uh, so that was an awesome, awesome feeling. Also being able to share that time with my son, were there, my brother, my nephew, they were all there. And that's really what hunting is, is about to me. One, you know, giving glory to God for making these amazing creatures and just giving us the ability to, to hunt them. And the other part is spending the time with the friends and family. This deer is in the books. I think he grossed a 205 inches gross. Uh, netted one right at 190 is, is the net in the books. As far as I know, the last time I had checked, this is the number three all time in the Cy Curtis books, archery kill for Lincoln County, number three. This buck I knew was living on me. I had left a camera up, didn't even realize I'd left one up, went to the farm in July to do some work, was walking down about three or 400 yards from where I shot this deer, and we had a stand that we called the dog leg and realized I left the camera up. Well, I pulled the card, came home, and when I plugged the card in the computer and started looking over the pictures, this buck was all over it. I had hundreds of pictures. I had pictures of this deer in velvet. I had pictures of this deer losing his velvet. I mean, he was living on me. One of the first times I've ever had a mature buck, by any means, just living on me. So I uh, had a feeder down by the well stand and it 
it, it had been going because it was a it was a it was a motor feeder, so it'd been going off all summer long. And I knew that if this buck was on that trail at that dog leg, that the way he was traveling, he was going to that feeder. So while we were down there, I went and made sure and filled it back up when it was full of corn. Came back in September, right before season opened, and still didn't have a camera on that feeder where this deer was going. But when we came back in September just to fill things up, this actual feeder was one of those shorter ones that, you know, the deer could get to it. And I'd seen them in the past when I'd be hunting, deer would walk up underneath it and lick it and, and, and get corn out, even though, you know, it, the motor hadn't come off yet. This feeder had, they had totally emptied this feeder between July to September when it shouldn't have been empty. This thing holds a lot of corn, but they were in there just turning that. So I filled it up. That was the weekend before bow season opened. So October 1st is when our season opens in Oklahoma. I didn't hunt. October 2nd, I didn't plan on hunting yet because like I said, I've never taken a big deer early. I'm that guy that's always said, all you're doing is educating your deer if you go hunt early. You know, you're gonna, you're gonna mess it up, wait till the rut, you know, all those kind of things. So I was gonna drive to the farm and put a camera on the feeder finally. But I thought, well, if you're gonna drive the farm, take your bow, you know, it's, I, I, this is a foolproof. If the wind's out of any southerly direction, I can get in this stand and I'm never gonna mess anything up. You're just, it's just not gonna happen the way this setup is. So I thought, well, go hunting. It's 95 degrees when I'm driving to the farm. I get to the farm, hang a camera on the feeder, and I get in my stand. And it's about 5.30 when I got in my stand, maybe five. It didn't get dark till almost eight at that time of year. So I'm sitting there, it's hot, I'm sweating, fighting mosquitoes, all those things. And I remember sending one of my good buddies a text and it said, man, it's 95 degrees, it's hot, I'm sweating, this is crazy, but I got a weird feeling about tonight. And about, before the sun ever fully set, I had one eight point come from the west, like they always do at this place, and he came into the feeder. Young eight, wasn't gonna shoot him, just, Man, I was happy just seeing a deer. Well, a couple minutes later, from the south, a bigger eight point comes in to the feeder, and now I got two. And I'm sitting there watching these two deer, and I'm thinking, man, my, this is awesome, man. Two bucks, early season. You know, I'm not even thinking about the mosquitoes anymore. I'm just watching deer. Those two younger bucks start sparring. This goes on for five, 10 minutes. I got video of it. I'm sitting there watching them do these things, thinking this is cool. Well. All of a sudden, they both just stop, jerk their heads, and look back to the southwest. Well, I can't see that far from where I'm sitting in the stand, but I knew it was another deer coming. So I'm kind of like to myself, I said, man, you might want to put your, your phone up and quit videoing and get your bow because you know what's living here. So I put my phone up, get my bow, and these other two deer, they won't move a muscle. And I could see, finally could see feet coming. And when I saw Rack, this is what I saw. And I mean, I'm just sitting there dumbfounded. I've, I mean, 95 degrees and I'm sitting there basically opening day. It's the second day of season and I'm just like, oh my gosh. He's at 25 yards broadside. I'm sitting there worried about drawing my bow because I got three bucks within 25 yards or less right there in front of me. One of the younger bucks walks behind this buck and kind of sticks his nose in his rear end and this buck hooks one of the smaller bucks and picks him up and they kind of bust like a covey of quail. And at that point I'm like, these deer don't even know you're here draw your bow and shoot this buck. So I'm sitting there and he's 25 yards and I'm shooting a single pin sight for the first year, but I had it on 25 yards because that's where my feeder was. I knew it was 25 yards. So no excuses, but I'm gonna tell him myself, this deer's at broadside. He's 25 yards away. I'm at full draw. These deer have no idea I'm there. I shot tons of deer with a bow and arrow, but on this buck, I punch my trigger or do something because the first arrow goes right in front of his back hips. I mean, as far back as you could hit him without taking hitting him in bone. It hit him right back there. He runs about 25 yards and stops directly away from me. And as I'm watching him, I'm pretty sure I was crying. I'm mad, I'm upset. I'm like, I can't believe you just made that shot on that buck. And I'm just begging him in my mind, like, please lay down right there. I'll go sleep in the truck tonight. I'll come get you in the morning. But he's got a lot of guts hanging out the exit wound where I'd shot this deer. I mean, I knew he was gonna hurt bad. I just, I don't, you know, you don't know. He finally turns after 10 minutes or so, he turns broadside and takes a step. I know he's exactly 50 yards. I have my single pin bow, first year using the single pin. 
I'd been practicing the night before at 60, and just because I'm like, I'm never gonna shoot a deer at 60 yards, but I was I was shooting and I was grouping it pretty good. I was like, man, at this point, what do you have to lose? Dial it to 50, you know he's 50, and put another arrow on this deer. So the other two bucks, they're back to sparring and goofing off. They have no idea what's just happened. So I draw my bow, shoot this deer at 50 yards, and when that second arrow hits that deer, I knew the deer was dead. I mean, I could not have walked down there and stabbed him any better with that arrow. It was just, it was meant to me, it was meant for me to kill this deer. And it was something I'll never forget. I mean, I was making, I made a phone call, probably sounded like a five-year-old schoolgirl, just excited with my buddies. And, you know, it made, it, they even put me on the news at one point, the, the local news channel, there's a girl named Tess Monty, and she's an outdoors woman, but she's a newscaster. And in the, in the, in the video and the pictures are posting up, I'm in cut off shorts, and a camouflage long sleeve t-shirt and flip flops. I mean, it's, it's it's the craziest setup ever, but that's that's the story of this buck and it's just something I'll, I'll never forget. Um, this is a deer I killed on Midwest Whitetail. Pretty cool, some cool things to this deer is, it starts actually the year before I killed him. Um, I had pictures of this deer and uh, just a really nice young buck with a lot of cool character had some of the same characteristics that you see he had this following year. And one of the things was uh, I told my dad, I was like, hey, if you could hold off from shooting this particular deer, I think he's young and he's got a lot of growth for next year. And I remember my dad coming home the last day of rifle season saying, hey, I shot one. <laughs> and uh, I was like, okay, where'd you hit it? He's like, well, I was facing me and I shot him in the shoulder and we went and blood trailed him and never found him. It, look kind of that white blood, like it just, you know, just barely got into anything, you know, we lost it. I was like, dad, do you think it was that big buck I told you not to shoot? He's like, I don't know, I don't think so. And I was like, okay, well, I set a camera up there and lo and behold, I get this buck, <laughs> he comes in and he's got a hole in his shoulder this big, the picture, and I was like, well, you shot him, hopefully you didn't kill him. And, you know, to this day, I give my dad a hard time, but, Fast forward to the next year, um, I was actually had another property I was really keen on on and TJ and I just happened to be driving around uh, pretty much this time of year, real early season. And we were glassing some bean fields and we saw this deer out there and TJ and I were like, oh my, like he looked like a giant out there. And I'm pretty sure this is the same deer my dad wounded. I wasn't hundred percent, but just with the same characteristics, I was pretty sure. And so we get an early season there and it was a really, we are in a drought, and I end up making my spot that I was gonna kill him at over a pond that had dried up that I put, uh, made into a little food plot. And I ended up shooting him on an evening there in October, and he was still in a bachelor group, and I killed him late one evening. Um, Derek was filming me with the filming equipment then, you know, it was, looked dark, and it was dark, but it was still within shooting light or shooting hours, and that shows on Midwest Whitetail too. Just a really fun hunt, and you know, the deer was, I knew was an absolute giant, had a lot of character, and <clears throat> it was, just keeps going there, and I thought I made a great shot. Ended up being a, a liver hit. It went back a few hours later, ended up bedding down. We jumped him up, and uh, so the next morning we went out there, my dad and uncle are trackers for the county, and so they're really good at tracking deer and humans. And I remember Derek was with me and we go after him. I can see my dad coming through a Milo field at us and Derek and I are ahead of him trying to pick this deer up where he went back into the trees. And I'm walking along and I got my bow and Derek's probably like 20 yards from me. And I see this deer, he's bedded underneath a tree and just his, his head's just kind of just wobbling around kind of dead. And I told Derek, I was like, stop. And Derek dwells down and I kind of, I had to kneel down to get beneath the tree line to be able to shoot him and I ended up shooting him and boom, he popped up. I got him right behind the shoulder. He popped up, ran another oh, 300 yards and finally died. But uh, it was a crazy story. He had a lot of life left into him. You know, I don't know if I wouldn't have got that second shot, whether I've ever found him. He might've ran off and I would have never found him, but I got into the liver and probably if we would have left him alone that night, he probably would have been right dead right there, 50 yards from where I made my initial shot. But you live and you learn. It's not the first mistake I've ever made in hunting, but uh, luckily I was able to find him. And uh, man, I was just lost for words. He just has a lot of character. 
he's a mainframe 10 with a bunch of splits, a lot of character. Honestly, don't think that deer was that old, um, but he has a beautiful early se season cape. I mounted this deer, and when I knew 100% that this was the same deer, it's because when we mounted them, and you can kind of see if you ever get a close up here, you can see the scar from where my dad shot him. So I made sure when my dad and I were mounted them, if the form wasn't big enough here, I was going to add on to it just so I could keep that scar on this mount. So this is my biggest buck of Saskatchewan buck. He, he's 220, and he was really, I didn't realize he was that good of a deer. Yet. And, he, and he just glancing at him, but these, you, you look at the mass and the, when you look at a, a, the, your big deer, your bigger bucks, they have to have a front, they have the frame. And the key number for a white-tailed deer to get into what we will call world-class status is a 25-inch main beam. When you get into, you get into bucks have 24, 25, 26-inch, they have these frames. And this buck is a 27, that's 27-inch main beams, just like this 195 buck. He's got 27 inch main beam, 25, 26, 27 inch main beams. When they have the frame there, then, then they, get, they get some size on them.